In this class, we're focusing on structural versions of Marxism, or what I call economic structuralism. Um, but I want to introduce you in a little more detail to post-structural Marxism, uh, sometimes known as critical theory, and there are some other terms as well. Um, but I want to introduce you in a little more detail to some of these concepts because you may come across them in a lot of your other classes, and, and I just want you to be aware um, of the connections. Uh, much post-colonial theory is based uh, in post-structural Marxism, and, and, and there are others as well. So just to start out with some key questions that Marxists have struggled with over the decades. Um, why did revolution not happen in Western Europe as it should have, right? Marx said revolution should happen in the most advanced industrial states, which in, of his time was Germany and England. But in fact, the big revolutions happened in peasant societies, Russia and then China. Uh, why has socialism uh, never really become popular in the United States in the sense that there's never been a t sort of European style socialist party in this country? Why do voters, at least in the opinion of, of uh, many adherents of this view, why do voters vote against their own economic interests? There was a famous uh, book uh, along this line called What's the Matter with Kansas, uh, written uh, sometime back. And the answer of post-structuralism um, to all these questions is the cultural hegemony, or they might say the ideological hegemony of capitalism. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that means and what that argument is. Um, so the key assumption here that underlies all post-structuralism of all kinds of different sorts is that all knowledge is for somebody, right? And that's especially true of knowledge about society and culture, whether it's true about uh, knowledge in physics and biology and the hard sciences, uh, people debate, uh, frankly, more than I think they should. Um, but but uh, um, post-structuralism rejects the idea that there is objective knowledge about society and culture and history. And they say that the questions we ask, the evidence we look at, and the answers we give is all constrained by the resources at our disposal, an economic factor, but also by our economic interests. Right? So, so when we talk about realism, is realism really an objective theory or do people put forward realism because that view of the world serves somebody's interests? The same thing uh, post-structural Marxists are going to ask about liberalism. Whose interests does that theory serve? Right? And so then there's this commitment that not only should politics serve the, uh, uh, the emancipation of the less privileged, the reduction of inequality, uh, but there's a view that, that that's the mission of scholarship as well. Um, and that post-structural scholarship or critical scholarship should be dedicated to uncovering right, uh, the aspects of other scholarship that is really serving the status quo, uh, or as I would like to put it, working for the man. So how does this work in politics? The argument is um, that in contrast to structural Marxism, which we've been talking about, that the key social processes are driven not so much by these concrete economic structures, such as wage bargaining and ownership of factories, but in the cultural and ideological spheres, right? As long as the way this economy and say this country works seems normal or natural, it seems uh, both wrong and illogical to fight those things. Uh, and this is the point that, that post-structuralists make is that the, the fact that things seem natural and normal makes it much harder to undo them, right? And, but the point that they make that, then is that what is natural is defined by the system itself and so serves the system. So let me give you um, a few more, uh, uh, well, let's start with a definition uh, sort of, of of ideological or cultural hegemony. And it's the idea that there are beliefs that are totally unquestioned, that are considered objective facts um, that actually serve particular interests. And if you treat a belief as a fact, it acts like one sometimes, right? Becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So for example, if we believe that it's perfectly normal that a CEO makes as much as uh, they do while a worker makes as much as they do, then you're never really even gonna think about whether you should challenge that. And if it seems like that's totally normal and that's the only way it can be, then it seems to you like challenging it, even if you don't like it, challenging it might be a waste of time, right? And so to the extent that lots of people believe that the system can't be changed, 
that makes it hard to organize to change the system. And so it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy because then the system can't be changed. So that's this idea of, of uh, ideological or cultural hegemony. And again, hegemony meaning just the dominance of a single way of thinking about ideas. Um, and, and the key point is in many cases, these are things we don't even talk about. They seem so normal to us. So let me give you some examples, right? We all think about, well, you go negotiate your wages. Um, we think of, of them as being uh, free deals, right? Deals between free actors. Um, critical theorists are going to ask, uh, are, they is, are is there really freedom there? Um, if somebody desperately needs a job in order to be able to feed their family or pay for their education, can they really said to be free or are they being coerced? Um, inequality is inevitable, right? That's something I think a lot of people, a lot of us take for granted. Some people are gonna be richer than others. Um, and as long as it's not too far out of hand, we might say it's okay. Um, is it inequality inevitable or is it the product of specific institutions that themselves could be changed, right? Um, this is a, a one that's a big issue now, right? Is uh, the gains of Chinese worker come at the expense of US workers, right? The idea that there's a zero sum game between the interests of Chinese workers and US workers. Is that actually the case? Or do all workers share a common language or common interest rather in raising uh, wages? Are, are Chinese workers and US workers in fact, uh, have a, do they in fact have a common interest in changing the system? And to, this, to that point, right, uh, nationalism. Is nationalism a natural thing such that the job of government is to do what is good for that nation? Uh, is that what, you know, we, when we talk about America first or protecting American workers, that kind of fits in with the, the it's a kind of an application of the fourth point to the third one. Um, or, as Marx said, is nationalism a tool that's used by capitalists to keep the workers in different countries uh, from uniting against capitalism everywhere? Uh, I'm not saying any of this is true. I'm saying these are the arguments, uh, the kinds of arguments that post-structuralist Marxists make. And what they all have in common is it's about shared ideas really being the key constraint on change rather than economic structure being the key constraint on change. Uh, so to put it slightly differently, for traditional Marxism, it's economics first and culture follows from that. And in post-structural Marxism, it can be the other way around. It's these ideas that come first and they determine the economics which come second. And in either version, right? Workers end up exploited in the end. So uh, kind of familiar version of the question I ask at, at the end of each of these presentations, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this approach? Where do you see this maybe uh, uh, helping you understand something that was puzzling before and which parts of it make you think, ah, I don't think so. So that's a, a question to ponder.